Welcome to another episode of How Then Shall We Live? I'm Myron Milkey, and I'm joined again by our senior pastor, Matt Dumas. Last time we talked about Americanism and Christianity. Yes, we, we did. And we got some feedback. We did. Most, most of it being positive. Um, we're actually shooting this one today as the third, third part is going to be uploaded. So Correct. we haven't got all the comments on right. the third one. So we'll be getting a few more of those and we'll, we okay. appreciate those. Most of them have been positive though. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, our topic for today is the Bible. And I know that's something you can talk about mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. And as you explained in our episode last week, right. Matt and I have been working out together for about seven years now. Correct. And we have some very interesting gym conversations. Mm -hmm. So we thought we kind of capture those on video, some of the conversations that we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about um, politics, social issues, health, movie, sports, which was mostly college football. Mostly college football. And that was Baylor. And I talk about baseball sometimes and your your eyes would kind of glaze over a little bit. Yes. But then we go back. It's not to, really a sport. But go okay. <laughs> so we go back to talk about college football. <laughs> but I got to say the best discussions we've had have been mm -hmm. on the Bible, mm -hmm. um, theology, just talking about what God's doing in our lives. So those, those are the most, those are the best conversations that mm -hmm. we have. So. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to okay. talk about the Bible. Um, you ready? I'm ready. Are we going to go as deep as we did last time? Maybe even a little deeper. We'll Ooh, see. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Let's find out. Okay. So I'm going to start out with a basic question. Okay. Why should we spend time reading God's Word? And you said this was the easy question? This is the easiest this question. This is the easiest Just question. Basic, most basic. <laughs> Why should we spend time reading God's Word? Um, well, if any, if you know me, you know that I always have to take it back to Genesis. Mm -hmm. And so God created a perfect world and, uh, the crowning creation, uh, or the crowning achievement of his creation was man who he created in his image, right? Man and woman. And in that perfect world, God was the one each day of creation. You see him say that, uh, you know, it created the the sun, moon, and stars. He created the, the, the waters and the land and all those things. And each day of creation, at the end of the, the day, it says, God says, looked at what he created and said, it's good, right? So, so each day of creation, we have this, it's good, it's good, it's good. So God is the one who's defining what's good. Makes sense. He's the guy who's making it all. Right. I say guy. Right. He's the God He's who's the God. creating everything. And so it's, it's kind of his, uh, Use the word sandbox, if you will. He he's the one who who puts it all together. So he has the right to to say what's what's good and what's not, what's right and what's wrong, and he defines that in in Genesis one and then two. In Genesis three, we have a serpent who shows up on the scene, and and Adam and Eve, our first parents, they they buy into the lie of the serpent and they rebel against their creator. And at that point, we're told that theologians call it the fall happened. And at that point, we know that that we died um, spiritually. We are separated from God. We know that emotionally we died. We see the relationship between the hand, man and his wife, that now instead of them being one and having this kind of this harmony within their relationship, now they're pointing fingers and talking about whose, whose fault it was. Um, we know that intellectually they also died at that point. There was a death that happened, and spiritually they died. Uh, I think I said spiritually. Physically, they, they okay. began to die. So everything began to deteriorate at that point. Um, now, as we look back, we just, you know, that's kind of a given for us. We know that that all things kind of have a, a life cycle and that, that everything kind of tends towards death and chaos. And, you know, our second law of thermodynamics, that everything tends from uh, from order to disorder. And so we see that in society. And so our minds are just like that. So when we when we decided to, to define truth for ourselves, which is in effect what Adam and Eve did, um, they wanted to be their own God. They wanted to decide what was right and wrong. We've been doing that ever since. And so when we do that, then there is no real standard of truth. The uh, truth is really kind of whatever I want to make it in the moment. And, and when I when when that becomes a thing, truth is always this moving target, and, and it always just kind of depends on how I feel that day or who I'm listening to or whatever. 
Why we spend time in God's word is, again, God is the one who created the whole heavens and earth. He's the one who created the world and how it was supposed to work. And so as we spend time reading God's word, we begin to see what truth is. And really, it starts to to work against a culture that is trying to always lie and always trying to corrupt the truth. And so the more time we spend in God's word, the more our minds then the Spirit takes the Word and begins to transform our thinking so that we begin to see um, that right is right and wrong is wrong. Instead of in our culture right now, we, we celebrate things that the Bible would say are wrong, and then we, we um, put down people who hold on to what's my, my, uh, it's true, what the Bible says is true or right. So. so you're talking about the entire Bible then, because I know a lot of people that read mostly the New Testament or exclusively the New Testament. What's the importance of reading the entire Bible? Uh, Because the Bible is a story. It's one story. It's 66 books. It was written over about 1,500 years. There's a number of different authors. You have uh, have prophets and you have kings who wrote. You have paupers. You have shepherds. Um, you have disciple. I mean, you have fishermen who are disciples, and you have tax collectors. You have all these different people. This collection of folks that God has used over fifteen hundred years to write, and you have a lot of different books. But if you put all those books together and you read through them, there's one story that works its way throughout the whole the whole of the sixty six the canon, and that's the story really of uh, creation, fall. Uh, and then this kind of redemption and recreation that God is right now. We're in that story of pursuit where where God has uh, redeeming His creation. And what? But one day we look from, forward to Jesus coming back and a new heavens and a new earth. And so the Genesis tells us how how we how it all got started, and it gives us the beginning of the story. But that story you're going to see that it's going to trail throughout the whole the whole Bible. So. So personally speaking, mm-hmm. um, I think it was around 2004, I've shared this mm-hmm. story with you. Um, I got really convicted because I actually hadn't read the whole Bible all the way through. Okay. And I won't I, say shame on you. <laughs> thank you. But I had read the New Testament many times, and right. I had read a good portion, if not all of the Old Testament. Okay. But I had never read it cover to cover. And... Like I said, it was it was back in 2004. I mm-hmm. got really convicted and say, I have not read the whole thing cover to cover. So as a kid, I had tried various reading plans. Um, you know, read the whole Bible in a year. You read four chapters in the Old Testament, a few chapters in the New Testament at night. Mm-hmm. I usually by about February kind of stop on that. Mm-hmm. So I came up with my own reading plan. I'll call it Myron's reading plan. Okay. <laughs> read at least one chapter a day mm-hmm. until I finish the whole Bible. Okay. And so there are some days I read only one, and some days I read maybe three or four, depending okay. upon what had happened, what what mm-hmm. the, what which book it was. And it took me two years. Mm-hmm. It took me two years. But I was I was on a plane, mm-hmm. December thirty first, two thousand six, and I finished Revelation. So I had read God's Word from cover to cover, mm-hmm. and I got it. Mm-hmm. It was God's story. Mm-hmm. And until I actually read it cover to cover, right. It, it didn't click right. it, because I hadn't read it. Right. And I could see it was God's story all the way through. Right. So that was, a, that was a pivotal moment for me. Mm-hmm. After that, I thought, well, now I want to be able to read it in a year's time. Mm-hmm. And um, right now I use, I use the Bible app on my phone. Right. Right. Um, I like using the chronological. Mm-hmm. And the last few years I've tried to uh, challenge myself to read the NIV mm-hmm. one year, the NASB the next year. Mm-hmm. Got the King James last year. That that mm-hmm. was a little harder for me to do, mm-hmm. but I did. I powered through. Right. Um, what 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 type of reading plan do you follow? Hmm. Those are all good. Um, so one of the things just to just to kind of back up a little bit. You you talked about reading through the whole story, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. beginning to end. Um, Actually, when you do a chronological plan, you're reading in the order that the books were right. written. So you're so you're kind of putting the story together in more of a succinct, straight line. And so that's probably for most people. If you want to read the whole Bible, that's that's a good way to do it. One of the things that sometimes can undermine um, the idea of the Bible as a story 
is some of our reading plans that have us jump from book to book and place to place. Um, and I know a lot of folks are that, that will say, oh, well, I read a chapter in this today and I'll read a verse over there or I open my Bible and just pick something right there. And what that does, I think sometimes it subtly teaches us that the Bible isn't a story. It's just almost like a um, reference book mm, or it's, okay. you know, I, I need to find the recipe for, you know, whatever, pot pie. So I'm going to open up my my instruction manual, find the recipe for pot pie, and then I'm going to make a pot pie. It's a Leviticus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so when we do that, again, we... we we would never do that if you're reading a novel. Right. So if you were to get, if you were to buy a novel today and you were to read the story, you would never just open up that novel to a page and pick a pick a piece of it and start to read that one piece. Uh, you wouldn't get the idea of the novel from doing that. So you would read it from from the beginning of the story to the end, and that helps you out. And so that would be my suggestion first off for people who are doing it is to to maybe start with the chronological so that you can get a sense of the whole story. Now, when I say that, I will also say this. Any time spent in God's Word is productive time. Because God's Word is capital T, truth, when I'm reading it, when I'm allowing it to, to kind of soak in, I'm learning truth. Now, I may not be putting it in with the whole story, and I may not have the flow of the story in it, but I'm still understanding truth. And so that's that's the important thing. Um, personally, what I do, I started this years ago, as I read through the Bible, and I use a chronological plan, so I just I read uh, whatever the the day is. That's that's kind of what I'm reading. Um, a few years back, I started adding that I would read a proverb a day and a psalm a day. And what I found is there's 31 proverbs, so you can finish. You know, you, you finish up the month, and then you start again in, in Proverbs chapter one. There's 150 psalms, so you can read 30 of those in, in one month, but in five months you've read through the psalms, then you just start again. But that, that kind of gives you a little bit of kind of that wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. Proverbs gives you the wisdom, sure. practical wisdom. Yep. And then the psalms is is really very expressive. To You know, it's uh, David's, uh, many times it's his worship that right. he's, he's sharing with us. Sometimes it's his frustrations. Um, shaking his fist at the at the sky, going, "Lord, why? Why do the why do the wicked seem to prosper at times?" But always, it comes back to appraising God. So that's that's where I am. So. Okay. Well, here at Central and mm -hmm. any church really, you have a wide range of spiritual maturity from people who are new to the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have been believers for decades. Right. And within that spectrum, you have folks who know the Bible really well, mm -hmm. and others that do not and right. really haven't read much of it at all. Mm -hmm. So let's start with those who haven't read much. Where does someone start and which translations are good ones hmm. and why? Hmm. Well, um, so for a brand new believer um, or a person who's brand new to reading the Bible, uh, a lot of times if you're starting anything, so you're going to start an exercise program or you're going to start um, trying to lose weight or whatever. Um, often it's it's small successes at first that kind of give you the, the confidence to, to move on to, to bigger things. And so I would, cho I would choose a book, uh, maybe a smaller book. You could, um, and most people like stories, so I would choose a story. If you're going to read a gospel, you might read Mark. Mm -hmm. It's 16 chapters. Um, if you're going to read one of the stories, you might go to, let's say, uh, Joshua. You know, Joshua is kind of a story. You could read the first, uh, you could read Genesis. Genesis is a story all the way throughout. And, and start with some of those where there are story and you can just kind of immerse yourself in the story and you can have some success saying, I finished a book. Sure. Jonah's a nice sure. small one. It's four chapters. Uh, it's a story most people are familiar with, the Jonah and the well. Mm -hmm. And so that's one you could start with too. And, and again, it gives you some success. You can say, hey, I finished a book of the Bible, and now I'm going to go back and I'm going to read something else. Uh, I wouldn't dive into more difficult books yet. Prof prophetic books tend to be a little a little harder to weed, weed through. Uh, weed through wade through. Sure. Uh, Revelation, it'd be fascinating for you to read, but it would be a lot harder to understand. Yep. And one of the things, too, when you're in the New Testament, you have to realize that the guys who were 
who God uses, right? We talked about the capital A apostles and the 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 ones that God used to, to put together the canon. They're very familiar with the Old Testament. So a lot of what they talk about is just pulling stuff from the Old Testament and then showing how it fits with our with believers at that time. And so so the more familiar you are with the Old Testament, the better you're going to understand the New Testament. So, so in your reading plan, maybe you do pick a New Testament book and you read something that's a little bit shorter and easier. Uh, but then go find an Old Testament book and read that. And then as you get confidence, you just you read a little bit more. And ultimately, I would say it'd be good if, if you made it your goal to every year you're reading through the Bible. Um, and again, it's not so I can get a merit badge when I go to church and everybody go, oh, wow, well, you're, you're a really whatever swell guy. But it's, it's because you're trying to train your mind to think differently. And you're trying to keep the whole story in mind. And so when I read through the Bible, and again, I get the whole story, the whole flow of the story. I know where I fit in that story. And, and as I interact with people during the day, and as I think about uh, life's problems and those things, uh, I'm able to pull pull scripture that that kind of helps me at those times, and that that leads me to another thing that's important: not only reading God's word, but but memorizing some of it. And I know for some folks, maybe you have never spent time memorizing the Bible. Maybe the last time you had to memorize something was for school, you know, when you were a kid or whatever. Uh, but memorizing scripture is a great great way to hide it in your heart and to keep it with you at all times. So. So when you're at the gro- line in the grocery store or when you're um, waiting for your Zoom call meeting or whatever to take place or whatever, that's it's a great time just to, to memorize some scripture. And usually what I would suggest folks do is what's an area that you struggle with? So if you worry a lot, find find a passage that talks about, you know, Philippians 4, 8, right? The, not to worry, right? Do, is it 4, 8? Yeah. Do not be anxious for anything but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, right? There you, so there you go. <laughs> so you find uh, you find a passage that that meets you where you are. If you're fearful, find look up those in a lot of Bibles in the back. The the concordance will tell you uh, different topics. And so you find a topic that maybe you struggle with and memorize a, a piece of scripture that goes with that, that that's gonna help you in those times of struggle that you can recall God's word. So sure. Uh, and the translations. Uh, I yeah. was get away with no, this. you're not going to get away with that one. Right. We're going to hit that one. So, so there's basically the the short answer is that not all translations are actually translations. Okay. So that means that they're not or what we would call translations. Um, so when you pull a Bible off the shelf, so if you were to pull NIV and NASB, you talked about ESV, uh, the the King James Version Bible off there, the message, uh, mm-hmm. if you were to pull some of those Bibles off the shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that's important to know is that certain translations are actual translations, which means that the, the people who put it together, they started with Greek or Hebrew, and it wasn't just one person, it was a group of them that got together and they worked on the translation of it. So it's, in some cases, the New American Standard, the ESV, um, and the King James are all a word-for-word translation, which means that they they took a Greek word and they gave it an English word, or they took a Hebrew word and they gave it an English word. <clears throat> Much like if you're going to translate English to Spanish, that's the, a similar thing. Uh, some translations, the NIV is more phrase for phrase. So instead of one word at a time, it's I take a, a, a maybe a, um, a small fragment of a sentence, not a whole sentence, but I want to take a couple of words together. So if there's Id- idioms or whatever that are used that I can pick those up and I'd say, okay, here's what it says in Greek, but this is the way I would say this in, in, in English. So it's a little less of the word for word. It's more phrase for phrase. That's the NIV. And then you have things like the message, which are, um, they're not translations per se. They're more paraphrases. Okay. So I'm taking an English Bible and I want to make it more readable for most people. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to reword some of the things that are difficult to say. Depending on what you want to do, uh, that's, that's kind of how you choose the Bible. If you're wanting to study, if you're wanting to spend time and really kind of understand what, what, what's being said, 
then I would say New American Standard or the ESV is a good translation. The King James is a little bit different in that there's a different, um, and it's not just because the language is a little bit older, but but the manuscripts, and we, I won't go too much into that, but the manuscripts underneath the King James are a little bit different than the manuscripts that are underneath um, the New American Standard and the ESV. Both are reliable. Both are going to see, teach the same truths, but you're going to see some some minor differences between some uh, minor doctrine kind of things. And so that's where, uh, if you see people who are, that are reading the King James and that, and they're only King James, there is a difference in that, what it's going to sound like and the way it words things and those kind of things. But if you're going to study, then you, t- you stick to translation. So the King James version you would study, um, you would study the ESV or the New American Standard. If you're going to just read, if your goal is just reading, the NIV is a, is easier, much re- easier to read. It's it's a smoother read for you. I would avoid um, probably more of the paraphrases because you're getting another step further away mm-hmm. from from what the word is, and so that's that's kind of where I am. Okay. Well, a while back you recommended a book to me by Dwight Pentecost. Hmm who is one of your professors at Dallas Correct. Theological Seminary. Yes. And in his book, Things to Come, he described the importance of interpreting Scripture correctly. Correct. So, again, from the viewpoint of a new believer, can you speak a little on biblical interpretation? Because some books are more poetry, some are prophecy, some are history. How do you how do you apply the interpretation of it as you're reading? Well, you actually just said it. Um, you have to understand what is the genre, right? What what are you reading? Mm-hmm. And so, if I'm reading a psalm, a psalm is very different because it's conveying truth, but it's conveying truth really through emotion. So, so I have to understand the emotion in the psalm. I have to understand where the psalm, what the psalmist is, kind of there, what they're, what's going on, so that I can understand. You know, are they happy? Are they sad? Are they angry? Are they, you know, is this a rejoicing thing? And so kind of understanding those things. If I'm reading a proverb, a proverb is more, uh, it's wisdom saying. So it's going to give me kind of almost short kind of here's here's what wisdom looks like, uh, practical wisdom. Um, stories. So your gospels are all stories. So stories work differently. Um, there's truth that's conveyed, but it's not conveyed. You need to go do this. And Jesus isn't pointing to us when he's doing that, but we learn more through the characters of the story. And, and, and as they're interacting and we see how they reacted to a situation and we get, sometimes the author will take a step back and tell us Mm -hmm. what we need to learn from that. But oftentimes we're learning through the process of the story. So, right. That's how we get the truth. And you get to the epistles. Paul is going to tell you straight up. He's going to point. In, he's going to put a pokey right in the chest, and he's yeah. going to say, "This is what you need to do." It's right? So there's thump you, thump you on the forehead. It, it's pretty <laughs> clear. And so understanding what kind of literature within the Bible you're reading is important. Um, the other thing is that that you have to realize is the Bible is God's truth that He's communicated to us, which means He wants us to understand it. So a lot of folks, when they go to read the Bible, they go, well, I just can't understand it. It's too hard, or it's too big, or it's too long, or it's whatever. And I would say, you know what? There's a lot of depth to the Bible. You could read the Bible through every year for the rest of your life. You'll learn something new Mm -hmm. each time you go through it. So there is tremendous depth there. But it's also written, God is trying to communicate truth, so he's not trying to hide it. He's not trying to make it fuzzy so that we don't understand what he's asking us right. to do. He wants us to know mm-hmm. what he wants us to do. And so if you've trusted in Jesus, one of the amazing benefits is, is the Spirit comes and dwells within you. Now, that doesn't mean that automatically you have all of the truth right there and right. you don't need to study, you don't need to do any of those things. But what it means is as I spend time reading God's word and as I spend time kind of meditating on it, so it takes some work, right? As I spend time doing that, that the spirit begins to work on my mind and taking that truth and changing my mind so that I begin to think differently. And and the, the, the word begins to have an impact on my life. Um, most people, I think, where they where they run into problems is 
they they treat again the Bible like a reference guide where I'm just going to go point to a verse and I'm going to say, okay, this verse means that. They, I call it parachuting in. I'm going to okay. parachute into a verse and then I'm going to try to figure out what this verse means instead of taking the time to read the whole book that they're in. So if you want to know what, what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, you read all of Ephesians, and then you see, okay, well, how what does Paul say in Ephesians 2, 1? And what does he say in Ephesians 2, 11? And, and you look at context, all the things that you would do. Again, if you were to read a novel, you would never just jump into one, one passage in the novel and try to figure out what that passage meant. You would read the whole chapter, or you would read the whole book to understand what that one passage meant. Well, that brings us to the ending of part one of How Then Shall We Live, the topic being the Bible. So join us next time, and take care.